or I need to stick it somewhere. Ugh. Well, it is great to be here, and I'm so glad that um, Pastor Dan is allowing uh, both Alan and I to speak to you today. Um, my friend Alan here today, he's from Oceanside, uh, California. As you can tell by the way he's dressed, he was brought up Jewish, and he's going to share how he came to know Messiah. And I'm just so thankful for Pastor Dan and the All Nations Church because you are a Jew and Gentile church. You'd see the need to reach both Jew and Gentile with the gospel, reaching them for Yeshua. That's Jesus' Hebrew name. Um, I did not grow up Jewish. I grew up Catholic, and it was Alma Henriquez who handed me a gospel track, and I looked on the back. It said a Baptist church. I said nice people from the south. I didn't know anything about Baptists. You know, but I went out to the church that night, and my life was changed. And Alan is going to share with you how his life was changed, coming to know his Messiah, okay, Jesus as well. And so, Alan, why don't you come and you share uh, with the people how you came to know the Lord. And I'll come back in, in the time I have left, uh, share with you a little bit about this Feast of Sukkot as we're in missions mode here at All Nations, all right? Shama Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 6. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. My name is Alan Chester. My Hebrew name is Avram. My last name actually was Chesterfield before it was changed. My mother's family uh, came from Russia. My father's side, I uh, came from England. She was born in Manchester, England. Last name Chesterfield, the Chester. So I was born and raised in a religious Jewish upbringing, uh, born in Long Beach, California, quite a ways from here. I went to Temple Beth David, uh, our whole life was around Jewish people. We observed all the festivities of Judaism, the Passover, Pesach, all the wonderful meals, even the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, as we are ending right now, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Rosh Hashanah. There are seven major festivities of Judaism. I went to Hebrew school starting at the age of eight all the way up to 13, to become bar mitzvah, which is kind of a Yiddish word, but it's uh, the son of the commandments, to become a man or mensch in Yiddish. And so uh, I was circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law that God gave to Moses. Everything that I did was to hopefully please my mom and dad, and, but I never had a relationship with God. Going through Hebrew school, asking questions of the rabbi, they really never told me about how to know who the Messiah was. And so here, as a young man, going through Hebrew school and learning Hebrew and to be prepared to become a man, I never had that relationship with God. I knew of God, and we had a, a book that we would pray prayers from. And those prayers, wonderful prayers, but they were never my prayer. There were prayers that were in a book that I repeated. And many of you may be sitting here wondering, you know, how, uh, how as a Jewish person, why would you want to believe that Jesus, your Yeshua, his Hebrew name, is the Messiah? Well, you know, today uh, there are quite a few Jewish people that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. So let me tell you what happened. So my mother and father, Albert and, and Maxine Chester, wonderful a Jewish mom and dad, and my mother would make all the wonderful Jewish delicacies, and we just, just wonderful times together with my grandmother and, and everything. And so, as I grew up, uh, I was a in the fourth grade at a public elementary school at the age of 10. First time I had ever experienced anti Semitism, someone called me a Jew boy, Christ killer, and all these other names that I'm not going to repeat here in church. I cried like a little baby. I, I went to 
the principal. The principal called my, my mother. She came down, and, and she looked at me, and she said, if you ever become one of them, you'll never be Jewish again. If you ever do it, you know, if, if you ever become one of them, you know, a Christian, or believe in that, they're, that Meshumet, or the traitor, it's a Yiddish word, a Meshugan, a crazy person, Jesus, you'll never be, never be Jewish again. You know, about 11 years old, I was home, and I made the mistake, and I said the name of Jesus in error, and my mother slapped me so hard on my face that it left a mark for like a day or two, and uh, at that point, I realized, boy, I, I better not say that name. And then, you know, growing up as in a Jewish uh, upbringing, we were told about the pogroms, the Inquisition, the, the Holocaust, and all the things that the Jewish people suffered as a result of Christians. That's what I was told, that Jewish people were killed in the name of Jesus. That's what I was told. I didn't really, I never, no, no one ever shared the gospel with me. No one ever gave me a track. It wasn't until I was in college. I was going to Long Beach State University in Long Beach, California. I wanted to be a journalist uh, in the world of selling advertisements. And I was in a, a classroom uh, that had tables. And I must have looked, around, looked away for a moment and someone had put like a, a little pamphlet, which I now know as a track, and had a Star David on there. And I looked at it and I'm looking all around and no one said anything, and I just opened it up and it starts out by saying the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and I slapped that book down, and, and I didn't want anything to do with it. In fact, I could hardly wait to get out of that classroom. I wanted to get a, make a beeline to that door and get away from that classroom as soon as possible. I didn't want to see that because of what happened to me when I was in the fourth grade, when I was called a Christ killer and a Jew boy and everything else. And so anti-Semitism, for the first time, again, for me, started at the age of 10. Well, class was over, and I made a beeline to that, like a door that was open, and there was these two big, uh, 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 they were on the uh, track team. One was a discus thrower, and the other one was a shot put thrower, and they were like, you know, at least six foot five, 250 pound, and I'm like, a little 185-year-old little boy there compared to them. So they said, we're the ones that gave you that pamphlet. I said, I don't want to talk about it. I'm Jewish. I was born a Jew. I will die a Jew. I want nothing to do with that, that Meshugana. Meshugana, again, the Yiddish word for a traitor, talking about Jesus. Then they asked me this question. They said, if the Messiah was to come today, how would you recognize him? Now, that was a question that I was unprepared for, and I had no answer. And they said, if we could show you in your own scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah, would you be willing to take a look at it? And for the first time, I was confronted with an issue. The issue was, I was always told that it was because of the Christians that the Jews were murdered and killed and and everything that had happened to them was because of Christians and so on. And I remember my mom and even my dad telling me that if I ever became a Christian, I would no longer be Jewish again. I would no longer be welcome to the family. I would never be able to come to the synagogue again. So all these things were going on in my mind. Well, I was working at a health spa, working my way through college at that time, and these young men found out that I worked there, and so they invited me to their home, and uh, they said, well, let's work out together, and I said, I'll do so as long as you don't mention that name. Don't mention that name. And they said, okay, that's fine. So we got to their home. We had a nice workout. We're all sweaty. It was during the summertime, and they, uh, they said, let's go inside, have something to drink. And so the, the mom was in the kitchen. Moms are always making something. So she brought out some lemonade. And, and the, the two boys and I were on a couch. And I was in the middle. And there was another man in the, in the corner in a sunken chair, which I assume was the father. He had a black book, you know, a book that had a, a black on the outside. But I didn't know what, was, what he was reading. And he said, uh, may I read something for you? And I said, well, it's your house. Uh, go ahead. 
So unknown to me, he turns to the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, which I'm sure most of you perhaps are familiar with the text. And we as Jewish people uh, are taught that in many ways, this particular chapter is referring to the nation of Israel, not referring to the Messiah. But if you read it very carefully, it's definitely talking about the Messiah. Well, two of the verses that he read were verses 5 and 6 of Isaiah 53 that said, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Our, our peace, our, I just blanked down now. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And then verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of his own. Now, those are just two of the verses. There are 13 of them. But he said, who is this talking about? Now, you have to understand from a Jewish perspective, this chapter is never read in, in, in the synagogue. It's not even part of the, the, the reading of the Torah or the, the, ha- the portions of the prophets. And so I had no idea. I thought he was talking from the Christian Bible. That's how Jewish people think that, you know, talking about uh, the Old Testament, they, they think of the Christian Bible or the New Testament Christian Bible. And he goes, this is talking about the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. I said, no, sir, I'm sorry. I'm Jewish. I was born a Jew, died a Jew. I was told that if I ever became a Christian, I, I would no longer be Jewish anymore. He goes, no, not at all. In fact, by accepting Jesus as the Messiah, you actually become more Jewish than you are probably now because you would finally understand that Jesus himself, Yeshua, he was born a Jew. All the first followers of him were Jewish. Everything about real Christianity was based on in Jewish roots. Well, I was confused, and so he wrote out on a piece of paper about 30 different prophecies that are from the Tanakh, the, the Hebrew Bible, about the coming of the Messiah. And he, he wrote the verse, and he wrote them all out, and then he wrote the fulfillment on another portion of paper. And then he made the mistake, well, not him, but I, <laughs> he wanted to give me the entire Bible. So he gave me this white leather-bound, uh, red letter tradition. Uh, 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 of, of the Bible, the whole Bible, the Old and New Testament. And I told him, I, I can't read the New Testament. That's, that's really forbidden for us to read. And my mom and dad, dad ever found out. Anyways, long story short, he gave me the Bible, and I was still living with my mom and dad, and I'm trying to figure out uh, how am I going to get this into the house without them <laughs> finding out about it. But I got in, and I hid it underneath my mattress, and, and then we all had dinner together. My mom and dad said, well, how did your day go Tell us what happened today. You think I was going to tell him what happened that day? <laughs> but anyways, uh, I did my homework, and later that night, I, I tried to find the New Testament, and I finally found Matthew, and as you know, it talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and I slammed the book. I didn't want to read it. Anyways, I went to my rabbi because I was totally confused. Because he told me, just like my mom and dad, uh, that if I ever became a Christian, I would never be Jewish again. I would never be allowed to come to the synagogue. And I started asking him questions about the Messiah. And he didn't really want to talk about it because a lot of Jewish people do. You know, this is something that they just really don't want to talk about. They want to live uh, a life uh, in a religious way, but when the Messiah, the topic of the Messiah comes up, it's like they don't want to talk about it. So anyways, I began my own search, spiritual journey of, of going through the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. I have what is here called the Masoretic Text. It has all the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible. And I began to look up the fulfillment of them in the New Testament. And it was right around uh, December 1975, January 1976. I don't remember the exact date but all I remember is this. I got on my knees for the first time in my life, started crying like a little baby, started confessing my sins. Uh, you know, on the day of Yom Kippur, Jewish people go to the synagogue and they fast 24 hours, 
and asking for forgiveness of their sins. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and I was on my knees, and I just asked God to reveal Jesus, Yeshua, as a Messiah to me. And it was like I slept like a little baby. I woke up the next morning, and I knew something had happened. I just didn't know exactly what had happened yet. But anyways, I got to school that day, and these boys, uh, I just happened to see them, and I told them what happened. They, we're going to get you baptized. We're going to get you baptized. <laughs> you know. and, and I said, well, wait, wait. So about uh, maybe two, three weeks old in my newfound faith, I still hadn't told my mom and dad. That's another story. But anyway, so these boys told me that this coming Sunday, that Sunday, was going to be the Lord's Supper. And I thought, you, you mean the Passover? Yeah, the Passover. Because I, it was right during the, it was you know very close to to the Passover, and so I, uh, I said okay. So I had just done reading John 13, if you're familiar with the text about about the Passover, and so every day they would remind me about uh, we're going to have the Lord's Supper this coming Sunday. I said, you mean the Passover? Yeah, the Passover. So every day they would remind me, and I'm getting pretty excited because, you know, the Passover, from a Jewish perspective, it's a, it's, a big, it's a big feast. So Saturday night, I started fasting. The next morning, which was Sunday, I got up, put my best suit on, and, and, uh, and I'm ready for this big Passover feast because they said the Lord's Supper. So I get to church, and they have a song and a sermon, and, and, and then they, the pastor, and we're in these pews, like these types of people. And the, the pastor said, okay, now we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it's about time. I'm famished, you know. Uh, and so anyways, all of a sudden they start bringing these like a little silver platter of these little tiny cups and, and, a, and, a, and a piece of little bread. And I'm thinking, this is it? This is the Lord's Supper? You know, from a Jewish perspective, I'm thinking about a big feast. That was my introduction to my first Lord's Supper or, or communion. Well, it took a long time before I told my mom and dad. And let me tell you, when I told them, they were not very happy. Uh, they said, you're not going to be able to live here anymore. Uh, we don't want anything to hear about that. Uh, they just cut me off. Uh, There's a lot of parts of my testimony that I can't tell, only because it was just way, way too long. But one man took me under his wings from a, from a church in California. He mentored me and discipled me. Otherwise, I wouldn't even know if I'd still be here. And so I just encourage you, but if you have never made that decision to accept Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, and have that personal relationship to be born again, I would love to talk to you. And I know uh, Brother John's going to preach here, but let me tell you, my life is not the same. I'm changed, and before my mother and father passed away, I led them to Jesus as the Messiah. So. Yeah, so uh, Brother John and I have been witnessing to a lot of Jewish people this past week because of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm sure you've probably seen perhaps some of these booths Anyways, I'm sure you've seen pictures all throughout New York about this man here. His name is Menachem Schneerson. He died in 1991. But a lot of your Hasidic Jews, the Orthodox Jews, believe that he is coming again, that he is their Messiah. Yet he never fulfilled even one of the prophecies of old that are, that are found in the Hebrew Bible. He never even lived a day in Israel. And yet... They believe that this man who died at the age of 94 is coming again as a Messiah. This is why it's so important to reach the Jewish people for Jesus. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Alan. It's been a blessing to have Alan here. He's come up to New York several times to work with other groups that um, reach out to Jewish people. And so uh, that's pretty exciting. I was so glad when I met him two years ago and he started coming with IBJM, our mission. And some of you might remember him from last year's uh, Thank God for Israel. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead before I pray, uh, try to blow this shofar. So this shofar, um, you know, during, we're familiar with it with during Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah is the new year. It's really calling the Jewish people to repent. And when you think about these fall feasts, they really show God's redemptive plan. You have Rosh Hashanah, the, 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 the theme is regathering, repentance, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, uh, the Jewish people like fast and uh, and and then you have Sukkot. That's that's a joyous feast. It's like the the it was known in the Bible as the feast, and we see Jesus celebrating it in John chapter seven. It was just called Hag, the feast. Okay, and it was really the the harvest festival, the ingathering. You know, I mean, uh, the Jewish people. Uh, these feasts really truly show what Messiah has done. In His first coming, we have the spring feast. Passover, we have Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Resurrection Day, and then we have 50 days later, Shavuot. And then we come to these fall feasts, okay, regathering, and how they represent us as believers. We, we know one day we're going to hear the trumpet, and we're going to be out of here, the rapture. We're going to be regathered to our Messiah in the air. And then, of course, we know Israel eventually, after the, at, towards the end of the tribulation, will be regathered, and God will blow the trumpet, and they will come back, and they're going to look upon whom they pierce, and that will be their day of Yom Kippur, their day of atonement, where they get forgiveness. And then, of course, Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, that's Messianic kingdom, okay? We're both Jew and Gentile, and people of all nations will will celebrate this feast, okay? I mean, it's truly a feast of joy. And it really has a lot to do with the nations and with missions. And so that's what we're going to look at today. In your Bible, if you have it, uh, we'll just take a few minutes here today. And um, here in Leviticus 23, okay? Leviticus 23. And 20 here in verse uh, 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the fifteenth day of the seventh month. It's, okay? Uh, today we're on the seventh day of uh, this feast of Sukkot. It's called Hoshiana Rabbah. This is the day that Jesus stood in the temple and um, in, in John chapter 7, and we're going to look at that. And uh, so this is like the last day of the feast. And then there's also an eighth day, and we'll read that here. It says here, on the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. Uh, therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And of course, that eighth day is known as Shemi Atzeret, and that's the day uh, where we see Jesus there in the temple in John chapter 8, where he claims he's the light of the world for no wrong purpose, because during the second temple period time, uh, there were over three 75-foot uh, large menorahs, and those lights would have been going out, and their Messiah, again, claims that he is the light of the world. That was one of the customs in the second temple period. And, of course, uh, uh, we know that uh, Messiah is the light of the world, and you and I, if we know Jesus as our Messiah, we're to be his lights to this dark and lost world. Amen? And so we see, in, uh, in this, especially in this feast, okay, that this is a feast for the nations. This represents the Messianic kingdom where Jew and Gentile will serve Messiah during that thousand-year reign of Messiah in Jerusalem. And it goes on to say here, uh, verse 37, these are the feasts of the Lord. These are the feasts of the Lord, the Moedim, the timeouts. I mean, there was a reason for timeouts, okay? There's a reason why Pastor Dan has chosen this time to have the Mission Emphasis Month, okay? Because it's harvest time. We're coming into Thanksgiving. Uh, the, the, many Bible scholars believe that this Feast of Sukkot, the pilgrims and others, when they were thinking about this day of Thanksgiving, were thinking of the Feast of Tabernacles, thinking of Sukkot. So how appropriate is that? And then it goes on to say here, These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, meat offering, sacrifice, drink offerings, everything upon his day. 
besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides your vows, and it goes on. Then look at verse 39. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, ye shall gather in the fruit of the land. Ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day it shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day you shall have a Sabbath. And then look at this unique thing about this feast. Uh, verse 40. And you shall take of you the first day bows of goodly trees, branches and palm trees, and bows of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You know, while we've been out this week, both uh, Alan and I, uh, if you're in a Jewish neighborhood, you see him holding the lulav and this thing that looks like an oversized lemon. Those are the four species that talks here, and they're to rejoice uh, with the Lord. Most scholars, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees had, you know, a, a riff, and so uh, the Sadducees said, well, they, they, you're just supposed to put that stuff on the top of the sukkah, you know, because we, it's to remind us of our 40-year wandering in Egypt where God protected us and kept us safe, and so they put that foliage up there. You know, and so uh, the others, the Pharisees, they said, no, you're supposed to take those in your hand and rejoice and, and turn in all areas, you know, down, showing that God is everywhere. And, of course, he is. It's a very messianic uh, celebration. And uh, even the Jewish people, you know, according to Numbers 29, I believe, it says over 70 sacrifices were uh, just bulls alone were given during uh, uh, Sukkot, and they represented all the 70 nations of that time, I guess in the second uh, temple period. And of course, uh, this, uh, to the Jewish people, this feast also shows that one day the God of Israel, he'll even uh, bring in uh, the Jewish people, I mean the non-Jewish people, into this feast. And of course, we know that Messiah has already come, and we're already a part of that, so we're just learning more and more about our Messiah when we look at these feasts. But then it goes on to say here in verse 41, And you shall keep the feast unto the Lord's seven days of a year, and it shall be a statute in every generation. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month, this month of Tishri. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared all unto the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray and thank you again for this uh, wonderful day. I just pray now as we have these few minutes to look at this feast and how it relates to us as believers in Yeshua, in Jesus, and how this feast, Lord, really uh, gives us uh, just uh, 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 a zeal and an excitement during this missions month as we're to reach all nations with the gospel. Heavenly Father, you started the mission program with Abraham because Abraham was going to be a blessing to all the world, and through Abraham, all nations would be blessed. And we thank you, Lord, how you've used the Jewish people uh, in, in missions, and that they, they were the first ones, and they were to reach the, the Gentiles. And so, Lord, again, we thank the Lord for this. We're so excited about Alan uh, coming to know his Messiah. We're so thankful, Lord, that you've give, given us the mandate to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And, Lord, we're to reach all people with the gospel. So, Lord, I just pray, be with us in these next few minutes as we look at this feast, as we uh, see what it means and how it relates to, uh, to missions and to reaching the lost with the gospel. And thank you again, Lord, for these time out, these Moedim that are holy convocations, the Lord's feast, that, Lord, we can learn so much about our Messiah and, and, and what it is that he wants us to do. So, Lord, I pray you just bless and be with us in these next few minutes, and may you get all the glory and praise. And we pray this in Messiah's blessed name. Amen. All right, and, um, you know, there's so many customs, and you know because I've spoken here before, I have no problem talking. I can talk, I can talk on and on, okay? But because there, there's so much to talk about in, the, in, in, in this feast. I mean, I remember when we would have the sukkah in the yard here, when Joy and I in 2000 came to work with uh, Pastor McArdle and Pastor Dan uh, when we got over here to, to Woodhaven, uh, we would build a sukkah in the yard here, and our Friends of Israel Sunday School class would always go into the sukkah. But I remember building it 
And all of these guys were coming by, especially uh, Latino men, they were coming by because they thought I was making a shed for the mower or something. I don't know what they thought, but I said, no, this is for the Feast of Tabernacles. It's just a temporary booth, you know, while the Jews were wandering in the, the desert. And they're like, no, no, it's not going to stay up. The wind's going to blow it over. I'm like, no, it's from the Jewish Feast of, you know, uh, Tabernacles. But anyways, I just, I just said, oh, forget it, you know, because I couldn't explain it to them, you know. But it was always so much fun. Fun because I remember they used to have a prophecy conference here, and I remember uh, Greg Hartman, he would always come, and he would say, hey, church, let's get ready, because one day for a, for a thousand years, we're going to be celebrating this feast where all the nations will come up to Israel, and, and those that won't come up to Israel, God will not send rain, you know, because rain, water is important during this time, because let's face it, Israel uh, is, is a land, it's, it's, it's mostly desert. Of course, uh, the Jewish people are there. They're, like, beautifying it. It's just wonderful. It's really blossoming, and, and the Jewish people are producing so much, and praise the Lord for all of that. But they depended on rain. It, it's this time in the synagogue they're praying for Geshem. They're praying for rains because in order to have a harvest, to have the spring harvest, the barley, the wheat, and all that for Passover, they need, they, they need to pray for rain. Rain is so important. And, you know, the, the two customs that were really became important um, in this feast uh, really came to be in the second temple period. So if you want to turn to John chapter 7, that would be good, John chapter 7. And here we see Yeshua, we see our Messiah celebrating the feast of Sukkot. It says, after these things, in, cha in, in chapter 7, verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because uh, the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go to Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that does anything in secret. I mean, even his own family, you know, didn't really... Uh, believe and, and really think much. I mean, so often when Messiah was sharing and witnessing, you know, uh, they were just uh, like, oh, he's beside himself, and they would try to get him to come because there would just be so much opposition. You know, you had the religious leaders and others. You know, it's just like us when we're going to go and share our faith or um, when we pray for missionaries, we need to pray that God will give them boldness and help them during the opposition because all of the missionaries that he, at all nations uh, that you support, I mean, I'm sure at times they have opposition. The people that they're going to don't necessarily want to hear the good news. But that's where you come in, where you can pray, and you can pray for protection. You can pray for direction in, in every way. I mean, when you think about this feast, the Feast of, of, of Sukkot, I mean, what's so common about this feast is that they are to build this sukkah, this, this tabernacle, and they're to live in this. I mean, they're to leave their comfortable homes for a whole week, okay? They have these nice homes, right? Every, you know, we live in warm house with heat. And here, God asked them to go out when it's cold, it starts raining, okay? I mean, it's not the most opportune time. But he says, you know, get out of your comfort zone and go out and, and remember what it was like, you know, to live in the desert, to live in the wilderness, what, what, a, what a testimony to us because we're just pilgrim people passing by here, folks. This is not our home, right? We're looking for a better home to go to. And, and we want to take as many people with us as we can. There's one custom our Jewish friends have, and it's called ushpizin. It means in Aramaic, it means guests or visitors. They, they, they ask guests to come into the sukkah. Some of it is kind of mystical, and well, I won't even go into it. But ushpizin means visitors or guests where, where you invite people in. You and I are to be inviting people to come to know their Messiah, both Jew and Gentile. We all work with or know or have family that are Jewish, and we can't leave them out of the mission program. And I'm, so, I'm kind of talking to the choir here because here at All Nations, I mean, obviously Pastor Dan, Pastor McCardle, and you folks really look highly on reaching Jewish people with the good news of the gospel. And so we want as many people to come as they can. I mean, when I think about uh, John chapter 7, look at what it says here. Now, today is the seventh day uh, of uh, Sukkot, okay? This is Hoshiana Rabbah, the great Hosanna, okay? And it says here, um, look at what it says 
here uh, in verse 37. It says, And the last day, the great day of the feast, Hoshiana Rabbah, uh, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If a man thirsts, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, though the scripture saith, out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he spake, uh, but this spake he of the, the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here at Hoshiana Rabbah, that, which is today, okay, our Jewish friends are in the sukkah. They're, they're going around the bima in the synagogue, waving the, 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 the uh, lulav, and they're, they're quoting Psalm 119.25, Save now, Hoshiana, Hoshiana. When did we hear that? At Passover, right? I mean, Messiah comes in the week before Passover, and they're taking palm branches and stuff. I mean, even Jewish tradition is that when Mashiach comes, they'll be, he'll, he'll be welcomed with palm branches. How wonderful uh, how all of this ties together. Here, during this time, not only the custom, the pool of Siloam, also where Jesus healed the blind man, and he was told to go wash in the pool of Siloam, right? And so they, they go down there to that pool of Siloam, and, they, and the priest would have a gold pitcher of water, and they would all be chanting and saying, save now, save now. And then they were starting to pour the water on the altar, and they kept on chanting Psalm, you know, 113 to 118, okay, saying, save now, come now, you know. And here, Messiah, in the midst of this, says, I'm the answer to your prayers, okay. I'm the Messiah, and so how wonderful is that, that at every holiday, at all these Jewish holidays, these, these times out, and really they're known as the Lord's Feast. So we're not commanded to, to observe them, that's for sure. I'm so thankful that Pastor Dan has me come here at times to share, like we have the Passover Seder, we celebrate Hanukkah and just different things like that. But you know what? We learn so much about Yeshua. We learn so much about Jesus by these feasts. And of course, we don't have to keep them. We're not under the law. But wow, what a message they send. When you think about the sukkah, re remembering that we're just pilgrim people just passing by, don't get so tied to this, to this life. Get so comfortable. Just like the Jewish people have to leave their, leave their home and enter into the sukkah. You and I, we have to leave our home if we're going to preach the gospel or share the gospel. Okay? We have to leave. We have to, we have, you know, in the, in the Great Commission, going to all the world. You know, that's not a suggestion. It's a command. Amen? We're, to, we're all to go. And so God wants to use us as a witness, as a testimony. Who knows how many Alan Chesters are out these doors, or John Gibson brought up in a Catholic home, okay, or a Buddhist person, or a Hindu person. I mean, there's people of all different walks of life and face. And you see all of these, these flags all over this auditorium, they represent people, people of different cultures and and languages, and this Feast of Sukkot, one day, all of the believers in all of these lands are going to be going up to this Feast of Tabernacles. We're just getting in on it a little bit earlier, okay? I mean, don't, don't wait till the party's over, okay? That, it's going to be a great, great celebration, but it can be a celebration now for us as believers. If we're willing to uh, be willing to go as missionaries, be willing to give as missionaries, be willing to pray okay, for those that we support. And it is so important that we as believers, you know, come aside those, our ambassadors, no matter where they are in the world, to help them and to pray for them that God would use them mightily. Amen? And when you see this Feast of Tabernacles, I mean, when I think about um, uh, the Jewish people, I want to read one verse to you and then we'll close, okay? It's in Revelation uh, cha chapter 7. I believe the 144,000 Jews, the first fruits of the, of the time of Jacob's trouble, what we know as the tribulation, the Jewish people are going to finish the missionary work uh, that needs to be done. And um, we'll, these people will be entering into the millennium, the thousand-year reign, but Look at this verse in Revelation 7, 9, uh, and 10. And again, you remember Sukkot is known as the Feast of Ingathering because it has to do with the, the, 
the, the harvest season, okay? We're in harvest time. We, we go out and reach everyone, to whosoever, you know? It says here in verses uh, 9 and 10, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Amen? Palms in their hand. Again, here you see the result of the Jewish people witnessing and sharing the gospel in all the world. Again, the Jewish people are a blessing. No matter what, whether in this church age, the, go the gospel mission started with the Jews. It's going to end with them too. Right now, they're, they're, they're far away from Hashem, far away from, from the God of Israel. But God wants to use you and I to be a testimony, to be a light. To, to offer them the, the, the only water of life that will quench their thirst, their Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful feast of Sukkot. It ends today. And, Lord, we know that uh, tomorrow is Shemi Atzeret, the eighth day of Sukkot. It starts, actually, this evening. And, Lord, we know that you were in the temple as the the menorah lamps were going out, and you proclaimed that you were the light of the world. And Father, we have so much work to do. Thank you again for all the missionaries that are re represented here at the All Nations Baptist Church. Thank you for Pastor Dan and all other pastors of this uh, great church, Lord, that had a zeal and a desire to reach all people. And I thank you, Father, that it is the reason why we are here, to make you known, to glorify you, to edify the saints, Lord, and to make you known. And I pray today, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that they will come to you, Lord. You say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If a person's willing to turn, repent of their sin, and trust you as their all-sufficient Savior. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if that's you today, won't you, won't you come and, 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 and speak to whoever invited you or speak to me or Brother Allen after the service because we would love to talk to you and show you from the scriptures how you can know 100% that if you were to die, you could have eternal life. And that's what the Messiah offers. So, Lord, bless each one and thank you again for this day. And, just be with uh, the, the next service today as, as uh, you, Lord, speak to the hearts of the people here at All Nations. And thank you again for this time. We pray this all in Messiah Jesus' name. Amen.